and welcome to this edition of Represent NYC on the Manhattan Neighborhood Network. I'm Councilmember Helen Rosenthal, representing the Upper West Side in the New York City Council, and I chair the Council's Committee on Women. Today we'll be talking about sexual harassment in the workplace, what the city is doing to combat it, and what more needs to be done. Earlier this month, Mayor de Blasio signed the City Council's Stop Sexual Harassment in NYC Act into law. The protections in this act are by far the broadest, the most far-reaching in the country. For the first time, all workers, both in the private and public sectors, in workplaces big and small, are protected against sexual harassment by the city's human rights law. Contract and freelance workers are protected too. Every workplace will have to provide training on what sexual harassment is and what to do if you have experienced or witnessed it. We are also requiring real accountability for city workers. This includes annual reporting from every city agency and anonymous surveys of every one of the city's 330,000 plus workers. But let's be real, no piece of legislation alone can fully address systemic issues like patriarchy, misogyny, and sexism. And so we're already thinking about next steps. I'm very pleased to be joined by Allegra Fischel, Executive Director of the Gender Equality Law Center and Maritza Silva Farrell, Executive Director of Align, in, uh, which is an alliance of labor and community-based organizations. Allegra, Maritza, thanks so much for joining me today. Thank you. Thank I you guess I'd like to start with, um, really for both of you, but Maritza, if you could start. In your years of working with community-based organizations, what do you hear about sexual harassment in the workplace? I mean, the work that we do in the city with community and labor, um, we also seen that many workers uh, have been afraid or stepping up. Uh, doesn't matter if you're a woman, a man, a transgender person, across the spectrum of gender, we see that when you are in a workplace and you are depending on a pay, um, you don't want to actually speak up because you might lose your jobs. So retaliation is something that we've seen. Uh, you see that a lot in restaurant industry, in the retail industry. Um, and you know, it's something that has become even common in many places. Yeah. Yeah. So when union folks are organizing and they have the laws in paper, uh, they always ask like, is the worker gonna come forward? You know what I like about what you're saying is you're giving specific Ex examples of specific industries and how we might need to have industry focused legislation. You know, when you talk about restaurants, my understanding is the concern is the cooks in the kitchen who are sexually harassing the waitresses. That's how it occurs. You know, for construction, women in the construction field, um, they get it a little bit of a different way. But you get it also from the customers, yeah. right? I, I know a person actually recently shared the story. Uh, she was really afraid of speaking up because not only her boss was her sexual harassing her, but also her employer. Like oh, she wow. would come up and talk to the boss and say like, you know, this, this, this client here, these customers are just saying yeah. things to me. And the employer was like, well, do your job. That's what's gonna get you tips, right? So if that is the systematic changes that's that we right. need to be tackling, I think the legislation sets the path. Now is how do we implement it, the question. That's right, that's a great segue. Allegra, same question. What sorts of cases are coming across your desk? Well, as a legal organization that represents clients in sexual harassment mm -hmm. cases, we, s we are receiving a lot of calls. But they are the same types of calls that we were receiving before, the new laws, the Me Too, and the Time's Up movements. They tend to be workers who are not, um, are not coming forward and complaining about sexual harassment against somebody who's high profile, like a powerful politician or a Hollywood mogul. 
They tend to work in similar industries, restaurant business, janitorial, manufacturing. Mm. They're essentially employees that are very disempowered and don't really garner media attention. So that's kind of consistent. We're not really seeing that much of a change. What I am seeing is that women are calling us who now realize they were sexually harassed maybe as much as 10 years ago. And we unfortunately have to tell them that there is no legal redress because of the statute of limitations. And that's mm -hmm. a great point. Um, it, one of our laws changed the statute of limitations uh, for the New York City human rights law so that perhaps you could use you know, the New York City human rights law as opposed to a state or federal one, but only to three years, from one to three years. Right. But in terms of filing with the agency, yeah. where many people who are pro bono, meaning they don't have a lawyer go to yeah. file, that's a huge mm -hmm. amount of time one to three years, so that's a tremendous change. And have you seen an uptick over time? Like in the last you know, five years, have the last one and a half years been particularly busy? I would say there is definitely an uptick of claims because I think more women and other people f who are victimized in the workplace are hearing media stories, are saying, hey, maybe I was sexually harassed. They're identifying with it. Um, but it's not as huge as you might think. I've been representing victims of sexual harassment pretty consistently for two decades, and many of the same people who were being harassed right. are still being harassed. But then, of course, they don't have the benefit yet of some of the changes under the city law. Well, that's exactly right. So over the next year, the new laws will go into effect. Yes. So, for example, um, by 2000. I think mid-2018, uh, all even private sector employers will be required to publicly post the city's anti-harassment provisions and they'll be, they're, they will be required to provide the sexual harassment training and that will go forward once every year. Do you think that'll have an impact? I mean, that it's something that we have to like do. I think it will be yeah. important for not only the employers to set up the trainings uh, with the workers, uh, with the management, um, and ensure that the employers understand that they are protected under the law and that they should come forward and actually uh, reward that rather than retaliate that. And I think it's again, I feel like the idea of shifting the systematic changes that we need to be doing in the city, I think those are the important pieces. Because mm -hmm. again, a piece of paper, a legislation, as you say earlier, it's not gonna change, right? Uh, it's not gonna change the way people behave. So what we're trying to do, I think, is through the training, not only to say this is the law that we're creating, but also is like, because this actually is gonna be important for your business. It's gonna be important for the culture of our communities, right? And it has to be also very in inclusive. We got to ensure that community folks who might not know English are able to understand the law, right? How are we expanding the uh, trainings uh, in different languages, depending on the locations and the places where people work, low which industries are traditionally more of uh, different other language uh, speaking, like mm -hmm. Spanish speaking, Chinese, and other languages. So how are we also making the, ins ensuring that these trainings are going to be inclusive to right. all gender, to all uh, languages, um, will be really critical and ensure that the employer is required to do it, and uh, I know that there should be some penalties connected to it, yep. um, because that's the only way they will respond, and that will help with the shifting of the culture. The issue of penalties, I think, is one where I'm not sure we were able to sink our teeth in mm -hmm. that well. Um, that could be something we need to do next. And enforcement in general, it's not like we wrote into the law that there's going to be a city employee now who goes around to every workplace mm -hmm. and makes sure they're complying. Instead, this will all be complaint driven. Mm -hmm. So we're going to have to educate everyone to, you know, let us know if it's not happening. How do you think these laws are going to work, Allegra? How will they help? Well, I think they're really a tremendous advancement. I mean, I think we still have to see how they're enforced, and I agree with everything that Maritza has said about they have to be accessible to people in terms of language. Um, I'll tell you the truth, I'm not entirely thrilled that the requirement is that they just get onto a computer program, essentially. The interactive training can be done online. 
I'm a strong believer that more effective training would be if they had to do in person where workers sit together and talk about sexual harassment online makes me think you can go into your office and close the door and how do we even know I mean can you just set the button and then go out and do something else so enforcement because you're talking about behavior you're talking about personal interactions those you know people understand you shouldn't do something but they don't always understand why or how to think differently um, so that's something that I think is really important I also agree with you Marie so there has to be a penalty for not doing it. I mean, one way would be to read into the law in terms of enforcing the law that employers don't do it. That could be one type of evidence to prove that it is a discriminatory work environment. It would take a little bit of drafting to deal with that. But I think overall, to have sexual harassment training is a tremendous advancement. Having a poster, just like you, you know that you get to be paid minimum wage. It's right out there on the board. Just like you know you can apply for workers' comp, it becomes normalized then that this is part of the, that the way the culture should be. And I think that's huge. So I think that's you great. You know, I think that was Majority Leader Cumbo's bill. Mm -hmm. um, and yeah, that was just terrific. You know, I'm pretty sure, I don't think it was written into the law, but I'm pretty sure that the Commission on Human Rights has the intention for the online training to be interactive in the sense that at certain places through it, you will have to interact. Um, you know, it requires a response from right. the person. Right. But there's, you know, there's no question that the in-person trainings um, are better. And the Commission on Human Rights actually said that if any private employer calls them, that they would be happy to go out and do an in-person training. They do mm -hmm. that now. Hopefully they'll get called upon more to do it. What we're always juggling is, you know, for these smaller workplaces mm -hmm. that we want to keep in business, we're doing all the right things. Minimum wage must be play, paid. You know, we have paid sick days now, um, family leave. All of these things are terrific. Mm -hmm. um, and I think owners want to do it. At some point for some owners, they need a little help. And maybe the um, online version will you know be satisfactory for those firms employment firms or businesses mm -hmm. but if a worker came forward to the human rights commission and said yeah we're getting the sexual harassment trainings no difference mm -hmm. um, that'll be valuable the commission will pursue that case you can add something i feel like it's also very critical to think about the stakeholders, like who the city can partner with, um, and as somebody who works very mm. closely with the building construction trades unions, the public sector union workers, I think partnering with unions in terms of like how do we do the trainings, because there is many trainings that are happening already with union members, uh, particularly right now with the public sector workers union with Aranjanas, right, and the threat of um, of that Supreme Court law. So how do that also That's connect right. to the trainings uh, so the employees uh, understand sort of the law, understand what they can do. Um, and in terms of construction, we just talked about it a, li a little bit earlier. Construction is a very di difficult industry. It's a dangerous industry where women recently are coming up more and more, right? And I'm particularly very proud to see so many women taking on those jobs. Absolutely. Um, and so how do we ensure that women in the construction industry continue doing those jobs without being ha sexually harassed? N I'm not saying that that is happening all the time, but I think this also provides an opportunity for them to have something else to hold on to in the workplaces. Yes. Um, and I feel like that's also going to be helping a little bit for the unions in the industry to be able to support. Because I know that the president of the building construction trades here in New York City and different affiliates are very much in, in support of figuring it out ways to support and enhance the women in the industry. So how do we ensure that that happens will be very critical. That's a great point. And you and I have already reached out to a couple of unions. Um, and I've found the building trades to be very receptive and also retail workers yeah. um, that that union is very excited to help get the work word out to their employees. So you're right, the partnerships there are going to be critical. And um, it's going to be critical that the Commission on Human Rights has trainings that are specific to specific industries. Yeah, that's a great point. You know, um, I mentioned uh, Majority Leader Cumbo, one of her bills. 
But you know, there were uh, 11 different bills, but they were championed by the speaker, uh, Corey Johnson. He's new in his term. This is mm -hmm. just, what, his fifth month, fourth <laughs> month yeah. as right. speaker. And this was his first package of bills wow. that he put through the council, um, which tells me a lot about where his priorities are. And, um, you know, I've told him this endlessly, but, you know, it's a real statement about how serious the city is in addressing these issues. So I think that's exciting. Right. Um, Allegra, given that uh, we're fighting the larger issue of gender equality, do you think these bills fit into that picture that they, you know, how do they fit in? And, and here I'm thinking more about sort of the spectrum of harassment that happens to women. You know, you could sort of say harassment, you workplace harassment escalating up to more physical abuse. Sexual harassment or gender-based harassment, I just want to pause to say that the law covers a broader spectrum mm. of, of just, it's not just women victims. Certainly women victims are probably the majority and those are mostly the people we hear about. Mm -hmm but it also covers men, and it covers people who are in one or more of the LGBTQ communities who have historically been harassed on the basis of gender. There's some statistics that say as many as 40% of people in one or more of those communities harassed in the workplace at wow. any given time. Um, so I just want to give a shout out to the, the laws that they cover a broader spectrum. It's, it's not, doesn't have to be sexual conduct. It can be gender-based conduct. But I think the biggest thing is that sexual harassment or gender-based harassment is probably one of the most pernicious forms of gender mm -hmm. discrimination. Because it, besides for the horrible experience that someone experiences, it often leads to them being pushed out of their job. Mm -hmm. They either leave because the situation's yeah. intolerable or they begin to take a lot of time off, they have absences, they don't know how to deal with the situation, they're fired for absenteeism, or not surprisingly, their work deteriorates because they feel so stressed out on the job. And of course, losing your job and not being able to support yourself or your family is probably the biggest issue of you know inequity in terms of gender. Right, why people yeah. are afraid to come forward. Exactly. You know, I spoke this morning at a, um, an event, or a couple hundred people in the room, and afterwards, this woman, probably in her mid-70s, came up to me and told me the most horrific story of what wow. had happened to her wow. in the private sector. And, and of course, she got no help whatsoever, left her job, and, um, you know, had tears in her eyes when she was thanking me for these bills. Mm -hmm. um, because, you know, there's hope mm -hmm. that maybe the next generation, for the next generation of women, they won't be pushed out of their jobs for these reasons. If we brainstorm just a little bit and think about uh, next steps, um, where do you think we need to go to strengthen these laws, to make it even easier for women to come forward? I think it also might be important to think about companies or places where there is some um, public funding that's been given. How do we connect that public funding to be able to hold them accountable in some way or another um, within this law? Um, I do think that it might also be really critical to think about other kinds of laws that can uh, help across gender, right? Like it, 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 and I, I think it's really important right now when um, there's other issues that, are talk that workers in the low wage industry are facing, right? Mm -hmm. So I just want to lift one more thing in terms of like, I just shared the story of the restaurant worker. Uh, but it is interesting because the restaurant workers face this kind of thing and workers who are in the tip industry Based are, are they actually have to take on the harassment, whichever kind of harassment might look like. To get their tips. To be able to get the tips. And that's the, the narrative, right? So thinking a little bit how this kind of uh, legislations and bills can, can also help educate people yeah. about why it's important not to connect the tips to their work yes. and how they need to be paid, right? Yes. 
So connecting more to uh, more intersec intersectional analysis, I think, of the issues. Mm -hmm. It's not just only women. It's not only one thing or one kind of harassment. It's overall how people in the workplace are treated. I mean, you talk about the basic days, the, all the benefits that we're trying to work right. to enhance the, the, the ability for a worker to have a quality of life, right? And, and that's one of them. Uh. So I like what you're saying. You're basically saying, if I'm understanding you right, that there are other efforts that um, your organization and others are making uh, that don't necessarily sound like uh, a gender um, harassment, you know, a gender-based equality issue, but really they have that impact as well. So changing tipped workers over to salary uh, workers, that would make all the difference. And the other thing I think would be important because who we are here in New York, um, I think we need to amplify this because it's, it's, it's really essentially a model for the country, right? We've seen that the, after the, the election of Donald Trump, yeah. I don't like to say his name, but after he got elected, um, many of the people who are used to harass others uh, because they don't like LGBTQ folks, so because they, you know, Donald Trump really feels very emboldened in terms of like coming uh, against women in many ways. Um, I think it's important for the city for the city to amplify this so that the country actually sees that we need to take this at the local level. So it really shows that the local legislations, local campaigns, can be a model for the entire country. Yeah. While we have an administration that is just so hard on many of our people. Yeah. Again, you're sort of uh, another. Uh, lane of issues, but it comes back to this as well. I was speaking with the, um, uh, the, the officer who, the commanding officer of the hate crimes unit to this point about number 45. Mm -hmm. And if you look at hate crimes, uh, the, the bump up is, you know, three months before his election to three months after mm -hmm. there was a serious bump up in hate crimes. So. Uh, I think that's exactly right, and, and we need uh, the municipalities to step up and do protections. Um, you know, Allegra, what are the other bills that we're looking to develop will help protect individuals reporting harassment from retaliation? We want to require a rebuttable presumption of harassment. In other words, the alleged abuser will have to prove that that person did not harass mm. the survivor. Um, does that make sense and, and would that be helpful? So in other words, um, you know, it's not that the survivor has to say, no, 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 he really did it. Sorry, I went back to gender pronouns, That's but okay. that person uh, really did harass me. Instead of that, the alleged harasser will have to prove that they did not do it. That there's a rebuttable presumption that they did. I think that might be hard to pass. <laughs> I'm not sure that the law would, would entertain that, but I think that often sexual harassment cases are not that hard to set up, right? The mm. language is often much more explicit. The conduct is much more offensive than in other areas of discrimination. I think it really has to do with courts and administrative bodies believing that that kind of conduct is really sexual harassment. And I think that's going to be more of a culture shift. For the courts as well. For the courts as well. Um, one of the things I love about the new law is that it has things that will help the culture shift for the employer. Because there have been terrific laws on the books for decades. The New York City Human Rights Law mm -hmm. has been on the books for decades. It's one of the most, in terms of uh, lawyering, one of the most progressive laws in the country, yeah. bar none. But nonetheless, women and men and LGBTQ individuals don't come forward because of what you were saying. There's a lot of fear. There's shame. There's fear of reprisal. And there's all kinds of other factors. And that's why I think to really make a dent in terms of prohibiting sexual harassment, there has to be a culture shift. The onus cannot be on someone coming forward. That that's has just right. created a culture of silence and shame. So that's why having training, I noticed part of the training mm -hmm. requires bystander intervention. Yes. Having like a zero tolerance 
training uh, supervisors and managers that if they see it, they got to stop it. It's not the it's not the person experiencing it who may feel so disenfranchised they can't come that's forward. Right. And so that's what I really see as the next kind of stage of evolving, both in terms of our society and our laws. That's exciting. I, we agree with you 100%. By we, I mean my legislative <laughs> team, uh, as we've been thinking about it. But that's really helpful to hear. You can imagine having a poster right next to the poster that says, uh, here's what to do if somebody chokes, right. having right. a poster right there saying mm -hmm. what to do if you're sexually harassed. Mm -hmm. And um, if you Google around, there actually is one that's modeled off of the choking poster. So really? they both <laughs> look very similar. Hopefully they and know the difference. Yeah, yeah. so yeah, that people will look at it sort of thinking they're going to see one thing and then seeing another and that opening up their eyes. Um, which is really That's exciting. hugely important because I can tell you that it's really amazing. So many times women will come to me and say, I didn't get, I'm short on my pay or um, they didn't pay a benefit or they marked me absent and I wasn't. And they march right into HR and complain. But if they're being sexually harassed, they feel too shameful to come forward because it just, they, they feel like they're not going to be believed. So normalizing a culture that says you march right in there the same way as if you think you're short in your pay would be really like revolutionary. Which by the way, that's on the spectrum as well. Intentionally uh, paying uh, one gender something different than the other. Right. Right. And I know I certainly have a story about that. I know many women do. Yeah, yeah. So Maritza and Allegra, thank you so much for your time. Thank you for sharing your experience and your knowledge about this incredibly important issue. Maybe we'll do this again a year from now and check in to see how we're doing. So I want to thank all the viewers out there too for watching Represent NYC on Manhattan Neighborhood Network. Goodbye. Mm -hmm.